I'm El Kemihira, and thank you for listening to Subject to Power. One area to look at when you're trying to figure out how one half of humanity became dominant and the other dominated is, for me, what happens in childhood. What happens to girls and boys that shape them so differently, that sets us on such different life paths? And there's no one I would rather talk to about that than my guest today, Carol Gilligan. Carol Gilligan is a towering presence in the field of developmental psychology. She exploded into her field in the late 1970s with a book called In a Different Voice, which I won't talk about here because she will tell you in the interview you're about to hear. But it made a very big splash, not just in psychology, but in the culture. Following that revolutionary book, Carol did something that had never been done before, which is study the psychological development of girls as they become adolescents and young women. Yeah, as late as 1990s, zero research had been done on the development of girls anywhere. So in this interview, we talk about what she calls her girl's work, as well as the evolution of her thinking and work over her extraordinary career. So maybe we can start with In a Different Voice as kind of a starting point. I would love to hear you talk about what was the impetus for those studies that made the book and why it was as revolutionary as it became? I'm delighted to start there and I'll tell you, I mean, because it's very fresh in my mind. This is the 1970s. And I had gotten my PhD in psychology in 1964, just before my second child was born. I'm the mother of three sons. And at the time, I was very put off by psychology for reasons that I had not theorized at all. It just seemed to me a rather flat. I had been an undergraduate in literature and, you know, to describe families as mother was cold, father was distant. I mean, that's just, you know, it's like, what? You know, that doesn't really tell you that much about what's going on. I have a part-time teaching job at Harvard. I've been teaching very part-time with Eric Erickson and his course on the human life cycle, so on identity, and then with Lawrence Kohlberg on moral development and so forth. It's the early 1970s. And remember, I'm coming from literature and history. So I think asking people hypothetical questions, should a man whose wife is dying steal a drug to save her life? It's just to me, it's like, you know, you can say anything hypothetically. What if you're actually facing a decision? And I noticed that the men in my section are very articulate about their opposition to the Vietnam War, which they think is unjust. But then when the subject of the draft comes up, which they're going to face as college seniors, they become very quiet. So that interests me a lot. I'm interested in how people deal with real decisions. So I'm going to interview them when they're seniors. And facing the draft, are they going to resist the draft and go to jail or to Canada? What are, what are they going to do? So that's my that's where I am. And in 73, President Nixon ends the draft. That's the year that they would graduate. So that's the end of my study. But what else happens in 1973? The Supreme Court in Roe v. Wade. And I think, oh, here's another situation where people come to a public place, pregnancy counseling clinics, and have to make a decision in a finite period of time and where issues of identity, who is the I in the question, what am I going to do? And questions of of morality, what is the right thing to do, what should I do, come into play. So I think, oh, here's another situation. Instead of people facing the draft, I will interview people who are pregnant and thinking about having an abortion. So I'm completely blind to gender. This this does not exist. I'm interested in identity and moral development as it plays out in real situations of conflict and choice. So. I start interviewing people who are pregnant and facing abortions. Women from street front clinics in Boston, the South End, from pregnancy counseling services like Planned Parenthood, and from university counseling services. Black women, white women, teenagers, 
you know, slightly older women, working class women. And between 73 and 75, we interviewed 29 women, four of whom go on to have the baby, two of whom miscarry. I think 21, if I'm counting right, have an abortion. And two, they were not sure and we didn't, couldn't contact them to find out what they did. And I remember sitting and reading these transcripts of these interviews. Now, I have been teaching psychology at Harvard at this time. Freud and, and Erickson and Piaget and Kohlberg, these theories of human development, and psychological development, cognitive development, moral development, all of these theories said that women, they don't understand women, which is really rather extraordinary to think about. Half the population. Freud writes... The sexual life of men alone is accessible to our research. That of women is veiled in impenetrable obscurity. Anyway, so here I am reading through these interviews with women, and my friend Dora Yulian comes over. I say to her, Dora, you know, I understand why these psychologists are having so much trouble understanding women. I said, because women often start from a very different place, from an assumption of connection rather than an assumption of separateness. And she says to me, that's interesting. Why don't you write about it? And that's the origin of In a Different Voice. In a Different Voice has the abortion decision study plus two other studies. What's very interesting to me at this point is the two central chapters of In a Different Voice are about the abortion decision study. And nobody practically talks about that. And I am fascinated why nobody talks about the abortion decisions. But what's crucial to me and this is really, I mean, particularly now, if you think about it, in 1973 with Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, says to women, you have a legitimate voice in making this decision. You have a decisive voice. You have constitutional right to make this choice. And so the authorities, now you have the church, you have fathers, and you have the court. The authorities are in conflict. And more than that, the court is speaking directly to a tradition that says to women that the good woman is selfless, that she's responsive to the needs and concerns of others, but she has basically no voice of her own. I mean, if she's really good, because that would be, quote, selfish, which was the word that I heard all the time. I heard women call whatever they wanted to do selfish. They wanted to have the baby, that was selfish. If they wanted to have the abortion, that was selfish. She has no needs and concerns of her own, only to respond to other people. I remember, I'll, I'll give you a, a, just a vignette. There's a woman, her name, I called her Nina. She was in her 20s. She's pregnant. She's involved with a law student. And he wants her to have the abortion because he wants to finish law school and he counts on her for his, her support. So I say to her, I understand. And he wants you to have an abortion, but what do you want to do? She says, what's wrong with doing something for someone you love? I say, nothing. But what do you want to do? It just goes around and around. And finally, after hearing this word selfish over and over again, I start asking women, if it's good to be empathic with people's needs and concerns, you're a person. Why is it selfish to respond to yourself? You're a person. And woman after a woman says, good question. So here's a whole tradition that has silenced women in the name of morality. It is suddenly being held up by some of the women to scrutiny. And what they see is that selflessness, acting as if you have no voice of your own, no perspective of your own, no values, or that you're just there to serve other people, rather than being the epitome of goodness, it's in fact morally problematic because what it signifies is an abdication of voice. It's like acting as if I have no voice and an evasion of responsibility in relationship. And I'm a psychologist and you play it out. Let's go back to Nina. Let's say she has the abortion because her boyfriend wants her not to have the baby so she can support him. So who is responsible for the abortion? Not her, him. So she blames him. So then you know what's going to happen in the relationship. That relationship, the act that was designed to save the relationship is going to, in fact, torpedo the relationship because she's going to blame him. And he's going to say at some point, look, I just told you what I wanted. You could do whatever you want to do. And of course, that's just devastating. So my study catches this moment when a whole tradition 
that in the name of morality, in the name of goodness, good women, has silenced women, is suddenly called into question. And I remember there was a Catholic nurse, and she had really bad scoliosis of the spine, and she had a two-year-old. Her husband was a roofer, and he was unemployed, so she was supporting the family. And she gets pregnant again, and the doctor says to her, with your scoliosis, if you continue this pregnancy, you're going to be bedridden. You won't be able to walk. You cannot, given this is the condition of your spine, have another pregnancy so close to this other one. She's the support of the family. She has a two-year-old. and You continue this pregnancy, you'll be better. And there's God. <laughs> you know? And I remember she says God can punish, but God can forgive. And she decides to have the abortion. So it created a space. And my study comes right into that space. So then I realized what I hadn't even realized, which is the psychology I've been teaching, also said women were deficient. And to the extent that women were different. Freud says women have less sense of justice than men. Kohlberg says women tend to score at stage three of his six-stage scale. Erickson says women confuse identity with intimacy. Piaget says girls give more importance to relationship than rules. And say, wait a minute, what you're calling deficient is a different way of thinking about what is a moral problem and how you go about solving it. And I write a book. That's called In a Different Voice. I write first the paper, then the book. It's not called In a Woman's Voice. That's not my point. It's like, here's a different way of thinking about morality. It starts from the premise that our lives are connected. They're interdependent. And the question is not, is this the right thing to do? But how do you act when there's no way to act that isn't going to cause harm? So I get catapulted from, I'm this very part-time person teaching at Harvard, to this, like, who are you? Then we have this kind of like wave of public confessions of psychologists saying, oh my God, I realized I did my study of achievement motivation or this or this or this, and I never included women or I never reported the data on women because I couldn't make sense of it. And I don't think I mentioned that in the article. You suddenly start to see this field is full of books like The Psychological World of the Teenager, a study of 175 boys. And you think, 175 boys are not representative of teenagers. And that book is co-authored by a man and a woman. So he doesn't see that the absence of girls or women is a problem, and she doesn't see it either. And so it's like this massive people being blind to the obvious. But it was like this resonated with people's experience. You know, it was not named or framed in a different voice, named something. And then in 1980, the head of, and I just finished in a different voice, the book, which comes out in 82. I've finished the manuscript of the book. It's being published. And Robert Parker becomes the principal of the Emma Willard School. And he's trying to read about adolescent girls and there's no literature. And the Handbook of Adolescent Psychology, this is amazing, comes out in 1980, edited by Jim Adelson, who's very, very excellent clinical psychologist. And he writes in this handbook that he asked the leading scholar, Anne Peterson, I knew her, to write a chapter for his handbook on female adolescent development. And she comes back and she says, there's not enough material on adolescent girls to warrant even one chapter. So he writes, this is 1980, adolescent girls simply have not been much studied. He writes, the psychology of adolescence is the psychology of the male youngster writ large. And then he says, But make no mistake, there's a systematic and pervasive masculine bias leading to an overemphasis on achievement and separation and the corresponding neglect of intimacy, nurturance, and love, meaning the psychology of men, of boys, is also distorted by this masculine bias. That's the big 1980 Handbook of Adolescent Psychology. So I think, oh, The psychology of women is constantly being compared to the psychology of men. Are women different from men? Are women the same as men? If women are different, who's better? Women or men? I think the psychology of women is resting on no developmental base. Nobody has studied girls. So I'm going to do what I think was the most straightforward piece of developmental research. We're going to go and start listening to girls and make girls the narrators of the move from childhood into adolescence, of coming of age. 
because the whole psychology of adolescence has not been listening to girls. So with my graduate students, we go and start listening to girls. And then that study is followed by the study we do at the Laurel School in Cleveland, which starts with pre-kindergarten. So now we're going to start with seven-year-olds, second graders, and follow girls from seven to 18 through high school. And that was, that's like the second wave of my research, which in some ways is, is more radical in the sense of really getting to the root of something. You know, we start out with this notion of girls are very relational and blah, blah, blah. And they're basically nice. Well, you just have to start listening to girls. So, you know, little Diane, she's eight. We call these eight-year-olds whistleblowers in the relational world. So Diane says, hey, was there ever a time, you know, where you, you had to make a decision you weren't sure what to do? She says, at dinner at night, when I try to speak, this eight-year-old, my brother and sister interrupt me, stealing my mother's attention. And the interviewer says, oh, what do you, know, what do, you do? And Diane said, I had brought a whistle to dinner. And every time they interrupted me, I blew the whistle. And the interviewer is stunned, says, oh, what happened? And Diane says, mother, brother, and sister suddenly stopped talking and looked at me. And I said, in a nice voice, she said, that's much nicer. And then Jesse, eight years old, tells the story of, I went over to my friend's house to play and she had another friend over and they weren't playing with me. So this was no fun for me. The interviewer says, what did you do? And she says, I went over to my friend and I said, this is no fun for me. If you're not going to play with me, I'm going to go home. The interviewer says, what happened? And Jesse says, my friend said, just go home. And then Jessie has this long thing about how she's going to teach her friend how it feels. And so these girls are navigating the relational world in a way of really naming what's going on. That was extraordinary for us as women. It's like, wait a minute, this is girls' voices. These are really honest, frank, fearless voices in relationship. And then you get to adolescence and the phrase, I don't know, starts to come into our interviews. And it's not so much an admission of ignorance as a cover for knowledge. It's like the word don't has come to stand between I and no. And the incentives for girls to not know what they know and not say what they really feel and think, but to know what other people want them to say and how they want them to feel, what they want them to know. And the reward for that is, I mean, all the bounties of this society rain down on them. They have relationships, they do well in school, they write the eight papers, except at the cost of not being present. And what fascinated me was the resistance of some girls, feisty girls, to covering the voice that says what they actually feel and think and insisting on being present in their relationships. And this work gets covered. It's in the New York Times. It's on the front page. It's always covered as girls lose their voices. I think, wait a minute, I'm writing about girls resisting losing their voices. And this culture is invested in girls losing their voices. And that's the girls' work. I mean, even now, I hear, we're going to help girls find their voices. And I think, you know, girls have their voices. But do you really want to hear what they'll say? I mean, it's like Greta Thunberg, the climate activist, with her one-person school strike. And she goes to Congress and they say, oh, thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing. And she says, don't thank me. Do something. Or there's Darnella Frazier. Of all the people who watched George Floyd being murdered, one person, a girl, a 17-year-old girl, black girl, holds up her phone and films the entire episode, which is why the white police can get convicted. So you talk about, I want girls to have their voices. Then you're going to hear the Greta Thunbergs, you'll hear the Darnella Frasers, you have the whistleblower. You know? I mean, that's what we uncovered. So that was like a huge opening into this tension between psychological development, that's what I was studying, and a culture that is invested in a loss of voice and a loss of relationship as a way, I think, of setting the stage for all kinds of 
forms of oppression that depend on people not being empathic, not picking up the feelings of other people, I mean, including violence against women. So there you are. And my colleague, Naomi Snyder, we wrote the book together, Why Does Patriarchy Persist? And she always says, there wouldn't be the pressure to silence women if women's voices weren't threatening something. You know, I mean... Exactly. You have a quote in Joining the Resistance saying, having seen girls resist self-silencing and noting the conflicts that followed within themselves and the adults around them, I realized that in order to understand what I was seeing, I had to ask resistance to what? That's right. That's exactly right. And that's where the word patriarchy came into my work. That there's a force out there. It's not just resistance to growing up or resistance to my mother. But it's resistance to a force which is in the world, which is really is offering girls. I Right now, what really strikes me most of all is the incentives that are given to girls and women to not say what we see and to basically to say what other people want us to see. And I just been, I now follow these words, actually, what I really think, how I actually feel and the phrase to be honest as the switch from what I think is a cover voice to the voice that goes undercover, which is basically a human voice. And that's the title of my book. You also say, I don't know, girls will say, as they bury an honest voice inside them, I don't care, boys say, as their relational desires become deep secrets. And I wanted to use that as kind of a prompt for girls burying their voices is one side of the coin, but something happens to boys as well. I mean, the minute you see with the girls work, that 10 year Harvard project connecting women's psychology to girls development, let's connect women's psychology to its history. And that is what happens to girls. And then to see that there's a point where psychological development comes up against a set of cultural and institutional norms and values that are going to require a sacrifice of relationship. You think, wait a minute, doesn't this happen to boys too? And there was something that I had been really interested in for a long time, which is that there was this observation sitting in the developmental literature, and we all know this. And the observation was from a 19th century psychiatrist in the middle of the 19th century said girls are more liable to suffer at adolescence meaning more liable than boys who are more liable to suffer at an earlier time in their development. That is roughly in the transition from early to middle childhood at the beginning of school in what psychiatrists call the Oedipal period. But we all know that in the early years of elementary school, in fact, there's an article, I think, in the Times today, that boys, the reading problems, the attention problems, the speech difficulties, the out of control and out of touch behavior. And Martin Seligman, who studies depression, says through the childhood years, boys show more signs of depression than girls in that listlessness and that sort of flat affect. But Seligman says that adolescence, there's a flip flop, that's his word. Suddenly, girls show more signs of depression, as well as we know, eating disorders and cutting, and so forth. I was interested because here is this developmental disparity. The children's resilience is at a heightened risk for little boys between the ages of four and seven, whereas for girls, the time of heightened risk to their resilience is at adolescence. That's how that comes. So then the question came for me. My work with girls was saying, because there's an initiation at this time and they're subjected to a force in the world that is offering them a deal that's a very bad deal psychologically, that if you will take yourself out of relationship by not saying what you're really feeling and thinking. I mean, there's a quote from a girl who I call Iris who says, if I were to say what I was feeling and thinking, no one would want to be with me. My voice would be too loud. So that's happening to girls and adolescents when you have this sudden high incidence of depression and eating disorders and anxiety. We're seeing it right now. Is this what's going on for boys between four and seven? So with my student, Judy Chu, we start going and observing little boys, the four and five and six-year-olds, pre-kindergarten to kindergarten into first grade. Exquisite researcher, so precise in her observations that at four and five, these little boys are so, and these are her words, attentive, authentic, articulate, and direct with one another and with her. 
And then as they move from pre-kindergarten into kindergarten and into first grade, they gradually become more inarticulate, more inattentive, more inauthentic, and more indirect with one another and with her. So in other words, what's happening to girls and adolescents is happening to boys between four and seven. And then Niobe Way, a former student of mine, writes this brilliant book called Deep Secrets, Adolescent Boys' Friendships and the Crisis of Connection, that this initiation then replays for boys during high school. So at the beginning of high school with puberty, boys have this sort of sudden close friendships among boys, you know, where they talk about their deep secrets. My friend and I, we're just, we just love one another. We're so close. We're just, you know, and these boys say, if you don't have someone to tell your secrets to, you'll go crazy or you'll be angry. At the end of high school, three quarters of the boys in her studies no longer have a best friend. And they say, why would you tell your secrets to anyone? That kind of thing. And so the girls' work was not, and that was the big thing for me. The girls' work was not just about girls. Because girls were at an age where they could talk about what was happening to them. They could reflect on it. And it just said that there's a basic tension between who we are as human beings and this culture we've created that requires us to dissociate ourselves from parts of our humanity. If you're interested in violence, well, that opens the way. The whole kind of interplay between the patriarchy and how girls and boys grow up. You say something, you say, patriarchy creates rifts in the psyche, dividing everyone from parts of themselves. Well, you know, my understanding of patriarchy, has it's a word I resisted using for a long time because it used to make people's eyes glaze over and then Trump got elected and everybody knew what it meant. And the time started using it, so it was easy. Anyway, to me, it's very specific which is the difference between patriarchy and democracy is patriarchy is based on gender. I mean, it literally is. It's pater, father. It's a hierarchy that privileges some men over other men, fathers over sons, white men over men of color, straight men over gay men, and all men over women. It's founded on gender, and specifically a gender binary, meaning splitting human qualities into the masculine and the feminine. What is reason? Reason is masculine. What is emotion? Emotion is feminine. What is the self? The self is masculine. What are relationships? Relationships are feminine. But we know now from the neuroscientists like Damasio that what used to be seen as the kind of markers of rationality, the separation of thought from emotion, is in fact a manifestation of injury or trauma because it's in our bodies and in our emotions that we pick up the music or the feeling of what happens, which then plays in our minds and our thoughts. So if we can disconnect our thoughts from our emotions and our minds from our bodies, we lose touch with the voice of experience. And then we become captive to false authority. We can't test authority against the grounds of experience. Or we become lost in thought. I mean, patriarchy is creating those kinds of rifts in the psyche that, that in fact we know now is it's a manifestation of trauma. It separates the self from relationships. It separates thought from emotion. It separates the mind from the body and on the grounds of gender. So a quote, real man doesn't need relationships. He can stand on his own feet. Whereas a good woman has no self. She's selfless. I mean, you just see it. The only amazing thing about this is that anybody repeats it because it's so patently absurd. That men don't feel and women don't think, that men don't care and women have no sense of justice. I mean, this is just it's nonsense. Why does this get repeated? But it does. So that's patriarch is very specific in my mind, how it forces people to separate themselves in the name of becoming a real man or a good woman from vital parts of our humanity. And then it undercuts human capacities that depend on integrating thought and emotion, mind and body, self and relationships. You can see that. So the initiation into patriarchy bears some of the hallmarks of trauma. Thank you for that beautiful explanation. I can't even tell you how many times in my own life I've come up against that whole logic of, you know, splitting thinking from emotion and that thinking is at a higher level 
and feeling is at a lower level of existence. I mean, we're made to feel this way as women, I feel like all the time that we don't think enough. You know, there's logic missing. But the notion that those two are separate functions are so sick in a way. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. But it, what, it, what the neuroscientists show us, and they all agree, is that, and we know this is true, it's, it's like we talk about it, it's a gut feeling and things like that, that we pick up things in our bodies. But it's like you have to use those body signals and reflect on them because they carry information. And if you want to cut people off from their experience, you have to cut them off from their bodies and their emotion because that's what registers are. As Demacia says, registers our experience from moment to moment, like a film running inside us continually. And then we have the experience of watching the film. And so, I mean, it makes complete sense. And I, I agree with you. I mean, it, it resonates with my experience. You're too emotional or that's subjective. And, I mean, you know. <laughs> Another thing I wanted to jump to as you're talking about the things in metaphor in pictures, I think your work is so interesting in its use, your use of art, whether it's performance art or observing paintings or playwriting. Or can you talk a little bit about the role of art? Well, obviously? because the thing about artists, I mean, there are two things that strike me is artists are observing the world. I mean, if you're interested in the human world, I mean, artists are very good observers. So why wouldn't you look at them and what they've observed? And the other thing is, of course, artists work associatively. And the psyche is associative. I start in a different voice with an example from Chekhov. I mean, I, you know, I come from literature. So my initial response to the field of psychology is it was flat compared to artists' depiction of the human world. And you know, in college, I'd studied Shakespeare and Tolstoy and Virginia Woolf and so forth. And that was my understanding of human experience when I did the girls' work. And then when the psychology of adolescence, no one had studied girls. But, you know, right? Girls had been in the world forever. <laughs> so you go back to Euripides in fifth century Athens and across cultures, Tsitsi, Dangaremba, in Zimbabwe, Charlotte Bronte in London, Toni Morrison here, Jamaica Kincaid in Antigua. I mean, a uh, member of the wedding, To Kill a Mockingbird, that these novelists, Margaret Atwood and Cat's Eye, they start with nine, 10, 11 year old girls. These are the girls, the whistleblowers. And they track what happens to these girls' voices as they move into adolescence. So, this story that wasn't being told by psychologists was being told by women's novelists because the woman novelist had to go back for that honest voice of the girl if she was going to be able to retrieve her voice and write. They had to retrieve the under voice and they talk about that struggle of this voice that goes undercover. I mean, at the end of Annie John, it's the same is true with Toni Morrison and Blue Sky. The girls who had been these resistors at the beginning have now taken on this cover story and they retell their history in the terms that the culture wants them to tell it. So in other words, the academic world, the intellectual world is not looking at girls, but I mean, girls are all around. So the artists, I mean, the artists are listening. So, you know, it's my way of moving across time and culture by saying, this is Tom Boo in C.C. Dangaremba's novel. This is Rahel in Arunda T. Roy's novel. This is Jane Eyre. This is Claudia in The Bluest Eye, Toni Morrison's novel. This is Annie John. Listen to these voices. And then look at what happens with the time that they get into as they reach adolescence. So it was a way of taking my research, like across culture and through time. That was why I used literature. And also because the artists are working I mean, they're really, they have their ear to the ground. Listen. Listen to the girls in your midst. I mean, listen to Greta Thunberg. Listen to Darnella Frazier. Why is it that of all the people watching that murder, it's a girl who holds up her phone. She says it wasn't right. He was suffering. He was in pain. And if I didn't film it, people wouldn't believe me. And if she hadn't filmed it, those policemen wouldn't have been convicted. There's obviously so much 
potential in adolescent girls, so much potential for resistance. And can you talk a little more about what it is that potentiality, what it is that makes well, it think so potent? No, I love your saying that. I mean, because that's exactly right. When people say to me, we want girls to, we want to help girls find their voices. I always say girls have their voices. But the question is, do you really want to hear what girls have to say? So the potential is huge. What's really striking to me right now is the incentives that are offered to girls and women to cover that voice. I have a student this year in my seminar on resisting injustice who talks about sowing a veil of doubt, that's her phrase, over women's knowledge so women can't trust what we know and that undermines our ability to resist. And we become captive to other people telling us what's the truth rather than going inward. Yeah, you talk about patriarchy as the false story, that we get wedded to a false story. I mean, there's so many parts of it. The false story, you can just go into philosophy. The problem of other minds, we cannot read other minds. So then if you work with four-year-old boys... And if you have a little four-year-old says to his mother, Mommy, you have a happy voice, but I also hear a little worried voice. So he's reading the emotion she's showing and the emotion that's also there. And you have another five-year-old says to his father, the father loses it and hits him in the middle of a divorce of the parents. It's tense. And the father says, oh, I'm so sorry, because the father had been hit by his father and he vowed to break the cycle. Says, so sorry to the five-year-old. I, I'm so sorry I hit you. I didn't mean to, and I really... I'm trying never to do that again. And the little five-year-old says, you're afraid that if you hit me when I grow up, I'll hit my children. And then I have another five-year-old says to his mother, why do you smile when you're sad? And she doesn't want to burden her child with her sadness. So she says, I'm not sad. And he says, mommy, I know you. I was inside you. So what's this problem of other minds? We have no access to other minds. We do. I mean, children read... The emotion and the emotion that's being withheld. Why do you smile when you're sad? So that's that. That's a false story. We don't know what other people are thinking and feeling because how can you read other minds? It's not true. The other false story is that relationships are basically tragic. I mean, love relationships end in tragedy. And they do if you can't repair the ruptures. And I think the The stunning finding that Naomi and I came to in our book, Why Does Patriarchy Persist?, was to see that what patriarchy does, I mean, relationships are not steady states. They're like the tides. They go in. I mean, we all know that. You lose touch with someone, then you get back in touch, then, you know, it just goes on. So the key thing is what happens with these ruptures in relationship? Can you repair them? And that the initiation into patriarchy shames the move to repair the rupture. So it makes the rupture irrevocable. So the loss is irrevocable. You can't repair it. And therefore, relationships become too dangerous. It's too much of a risk of loss. The researchers come in in the 1980s and they start filming babies with their mothers. Two-minute still-faced experiment, a one-year-old baby. At a certain point, the researcher says to the mother, stop responding, make your face a still face. And instantly, the baby takes it out. The loss of connection, the mother has stopped responding. Immediately, the baby moves to repair the rupture. And when the mother doesn't respond, because she's been told for two minutes she has to keep her face unresponsive, you see the baby repeat everything that had gotten a response from the mother. And if it doesn't, you see the body posture stiffen and the voice shift from a cadenced relational voice to this high pitched screaming. So you see the loss of relationship is manifest by a change in the body posture and a change in voice. So we start out with a voice, even before language, babies communicate their inner state. We can communicate our experience through our voice. So the question is not how do we gain the capacity, it's how do we lose the capacity. So the false story, I mean, it's like what we were talking about before. The separation of reason from emotion is no longer the achievement of rationality. It's a manifestation of brain injury or trauma. The separation of the self from relationship is not the, the achievement of autonomy. It's what happens in trauma. So 
yeah, we had been telling a false story. And the patriarchal story holds that story in place by by forcing a loss of relationship, it makes relationship too risky and too painful. Yeah. I wanted to pivot into something else, which is I've worked a lot with women who are going through family court or criminal court and how going through the system is hugely damaging to women, whether it's trying to prove domestic violence or sexual assault or gain custody of their children or whatever it is. It's like this punishing, alienating experience that seem to not understand how women's lives looks like or what it even is. And so it just makes me think about your work around rules versus context, codified patriarchal systems, and the women who are forced to live through them. I know that was a kind of a ramble. No, but no, no, no. I mean, I was just thinking what, exactly where you went, which takes me back to in a different voice, which is in that framework of what how morality is defined there. Women were always found to be less moral, less developed, quote, good in the sense of like angels or bad. You know, selfish, good women and bad women. But there was no way in that framework for women to say what they knew through their experience. That framework was set out that really basically it's like if you were taking a photograph and cropping it and cropping out all the things that were part of the experience that for women were relevant. And what you're talking about is coming into courts, family court, domestic court. Women are coming into a framework that will not admit. I mean, really thinking about framing a picture, cropping a, a photograph, will not admit the things that are absolutely relevant. For example, if, if the judge says, well, why didn't you leave? Well, in fact, for a woman, she knows that's the most dangerous. That's the point where she really will get killed if she tries to leave. So she will try to talk and she will experience herself being misheard, misunderstood. The framework is framed under a set of assumptions that don't include, that don't encompass things that are key to what women know through their experience about what contributes to domestic violence. I mean, one of the things that in this current book, In a Human Voice, I start with Anita Hill and my experience of listening to her and hearing her and then hearing her being misheard. And that I related to. And I thought it explained something to me which I hadn't understood, which is why so often I had chosen to say nothing. And I think, you know, when people say, we're going to help girls find their voices, I say girls have their voices or women have their voices. But I think women's choice is not to speak often is for the sense of if I try to say what I really think and feel, people will not understand me. And I'll be misunderstood in ways that are really wounding to me and hurtful to me. I think that's what you're dealing with with the family court. Like psychology, like history, like theology. Those are a set of rules that were written by people who were not women. And it set up the rules of what's admissible and what's not admissible, that what you really want to bring in because to you it's important is not seen as admissible. So you basically can't tell your story. And for a long time, people separate the problem from the context. And therefore, in a way, assuming I think that everybody's experience was the experience of white privileged men or that the things in the context that those in positions of privilege and power basically couldn't afford to see or to think about. I mean, like the whole thing about abortion, which is the whole question about the life of the fetus is separated from any set of decisions about taking care of that fetus when it gets older. I remember there was a teenage girl in our abortion study, and her boyfriend convinced her to have the baby and not to, quote, kill his child. So she has the baby. He, you might say, predictably disappears. And suddenly she's all alone with a baby to take care of and no resources. And she's so completely taken aback by the, the difficulty of her situation. There was no preparation for it, but the decision was completely separated from the context of what in fact was going to happen if this 16-year-old has this baby. Boyfriend disappears, there's no resources, she has no money, she's a child herself. But one of the questions we asked, Mary and I asked the pregnant women were, who is involved in making this decision? And it wasn't just me 
in the fetus, whatever. I mean, as if you are standing on a trampoline. So every move you make kind of reverberates through a whole network of relationships, all of which are relevant to what I do in this place. So that's what context means. It makes me reflect on just how little the context of women's lived experience is taken into account anywhere. I almost flip it and I say the need not to take it into account. Because if you took it into account, you'd have to address it. You know, look, we live in a society even now where the infrastructure bill gets passed and the military budget gets passed. And there's no money for childcare, and there's no money for things that fall disproportionately on women, care of the elderly and the sick and so forth and so on. In a way, because the actual unspoken agenda is they want women to stay at home and take care of everybody for no, you know, and to be dependent then. But that's not even said. Yeah, that truth is buried very, very deep, I think. And especially now that at a time where in the West, at any rate, uh, where we tell ourselves that we have achieved equality or something close. And so the truth of kind of what the desire and the goals of patriarchy is, is buried very deep. I think that's right. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. I wanted to jump to something completely different. You have an interesting chapter about Freud. And it's hard to quantify, I think, his power and the power and influence of Freud on not just psychology as a field, but on women in the West through the ages. You talk about his history, and I would love for you to talk about your read on what happened with with Freud. Because I just taught that again. I mean, because you go back to studies on hysteria which is the 1890s, where Freud says women were my teachers. And he has this quote about the patient, they were mostly women, knows everything of pathogenic, meaning disease-causing significance about her symptoms, though she may not know that she knows it. So the, the beginning of psychoanalysis, that for him to be able to be helpful to these women, was he realized he had to connect them to what they knew. So when they said, I don't know, he would say, you know. So Freud is starting to learn what women know in a society where women's knowledge is not part of the public knowledge. And I mean, he he says, I've come to the head of the Nile. I've discovered the origins of neurosis in, in childhood trauma. I'm reading this quote because it was just extraordinary to me. For a brief decade, this is Judy Herman, men of science listened to women with a devotion and respect unparalleled before or since. In the mid-1890s, Janet in France and Freud and Breuer in Vienna, they said that hysteria is caused by trauma, and they wrote about dissociation or double consciousness of how we can know parts of our experience outside of our awareness, so we can know and then not know what we know. And that first patient of Breuer's, who named it the talking cure, and she talked about, quote, following back the thread of memory. And Freud said hysterics suffer mainly from reminiscences. The current way of thinking was contingent on women forgetting. Whereas Judy Herman says that the perpetrator depends on the bystander to do nothing. So then what happens is, she says, the dominant psychological theory of the next century was founded on the denial of women's reality. And Freud backed away. And and you see in the Dora case where he says, if Dora says no, that means yes, I know better than she knows what she really means by her experience. And the way I see this is, it was because women's voices and what women knew and women remembered was so disruptive to people's understanding of reality that they simply... You couldn't, I really think it's less a story about Freud as such. You know, what's so striking to me right now with the Dobbs decision that women's voices threaten something that people have a huge investment in. And so what's offered to women to not say what we really think, to not say how we actually feel 
to learn how we're supposed to think and feel and what we're supposed to know and also what we're supposed to not know. There's a huge investment in that because so much is at stake. I mean, I think that's what this is all about. Yes. So agree with that. You say something like Freud was using a psychoanalytic method to unlock one of the deepest secrets of patriarchy, what daughters know about their fathers. Well, you know, you just think about this. I think about women. I mean, we live intimately with men. I mean, if I were to say patriarchy depends on men's violence or the threat of men's violence to hold its hierarchy in place, it's privileging and on women's silence to keep it secrets. Because the point is, as mothers, as daughters, as sisters, as lovers, as friends of men, we know men intimately. And that knowledge, if women are in silence, that knowledge becomes public and the whole story gets exposed as a sham. That, you know, where strength is shown, there's really weakness, I mean, that kind of thing. So, I mean, more and more, I think the story of Freud is less about how terrible Freud is. And Freud does go on to say ridiculous things. Women have less sense of justice. Women don't know how to love. It's ridiculous. Then it's just just that he started from such a radical place. He was a doctor and these women came with symptoms that made no sense. This young woman with no neurological problems couldn't, as she said, take a single step forward without she has such pains in her leg and he's trying to help her. And he realizes this phrase, her love had already become separated from her knowledge. So he has to connect her with what she knows. And that was securing the hysteria. There's a whole culture, a whole politics contingent on women forgetting, women not knowing, men not knowing. And these women are going to give voice to what's going on. You've got to silence these women. That's what I think this is about. And so in the short time between 1892, the studies on hysteria, 1895 and 96, and the Dora case 10 years later in 1905, suddenly well, he says in 1920 that women are a dark continent for psychology. In other words, psychology doesn't understand half the population. It's an incredible statement, but it was sort of accepted. And people keep teaching Freud while he's telling you he doesn't understand half the population. Come on. I think you make the case that his whole life and prestige and career, his manhood, depended on siding with the patriarchy. Of course. That's how he gets a professorship. That's how he gets promoted. That's still going on. And that's still going on right now. Yeah. As we're speaking, there is a woman's revolution, like a real life bloody in the streets revolution in Iran. Which is astonishing. So I wanted to get your, you know, just your reflections on what we're seeing and also reflect on men, young and old, are joining. Yeah. First of all, I would have to say the incredible courage of those women. I mean, the incredible courage, because they know what they're risking. I mean, the risk is just huge. So you have to say, a huge amount is at stake where they wouldn't be doing this. And then with the men, I would just say the men have a huge stake in the women's rebellion because they're suffering too, although they're told that they're benefiting from this system. The courage of the women is, is, is breathtaking. To rip off their hijabs, to throw them in the fire and ferment it. To me, they realize, first of all, that these women deserve their support, but also... It's in the men's interest because what's being policed is the minute details of what a woman wears, of that male control theocratic structure in their own. But it's not so different from what's going on. I mean, the Dobbs decision is the same thing. I mean, that's another version of the same thing. A little girl who's been, just to take the extreme, who's been raped or who's the victim of incest, which means raped by somebody in the family, and forced to carry the pregnancy to term. That, what was it, a 10 year old who had to go to Indiana to get an abortion? It's the same thing. Yes. And I think people underestimate that when the patriarchy is threatened, this is what goes on. I mean, that you get this extreme enforcement. I mean, there was a more, slightly more enlightened regime in Iran until this last president, but it's cracked down on women. 
I wanted to get into what is it that's contained in feminism to your mind, and you've written a lot about it, both on your own and with other authors, what is contained within feminism that offers an antidote to what we're what we're looking at. Yeah, you know, I I mean it's just like I came to a very specific understanding of patriarchy because my work is basically psychological. So if I'm going to bring in these political concepts, it has to be very discreet and specific. Feminism, I think, is one of the great liberations in human history. It's a movement to free democracy from patriarchy. I mean that's just it. It's not a battle between women and men. It's a thing where I think for reasons in my work that you can explain it in terms of the later initiation of girls, that women's voices are absolutely key because women can name and describe, but it's much harder for little four and five-year-old boys because they're just four and five. They don't have the cognitive capacity. They don't have the experience. And they're not in a slightly outside position so that women coming of age can name their encounter with this force. And it is like a force that is going to force them to give up what they really want, which is, as one girl says, honest relationships, meaning to live with integrity in connection with yourself in relationship with other people. That's what we want as human beings. So that's my view of feminism. I think it's in the interest of humans. And it's aligned with Bring democracy from patriarchy. Democracy is based on the premise of equal voice. Why is equal voice important? Because if you don't have equal voice, you can't solve conflicts in relationship. You can only solve conflicts through the use of force. So equal voice is the condition for love and for democracy. That's why I think feminism is one of the great liberation movements in human history. And I think it's why it's contested. I'm not surprised It's like, do you think patriarchy was not going to fight back? Patriarchy needs the complicity of some women. There are huge incentives held out to women to basically align with, in order of living that silences women or separates women from what women know on the basis of their own experience and calls that emotional, subjective, crazy, and honest voices called by girls as they come of age, stupid rude, and Frank calls unpleasant, insufferable, too loud, too angry, wrong, bad, crazy. And if you simply don't say what you're really feeling and thinking, you'll get A's in school. You'll be one of the girls who's included. People will want to be with you. You know, you'll be the good colleague. You'll be hired as partner in the law firm. You'll get married. And, you know, that's the deal. You want honor, riches, marriage, blessing, or you want dishonor and live in poverty and you'll be all alone and you'll be cursed and your choice, which you want. There are huge incentives and there's also a huge force for resistance. And I think we're living in the midst, I mean, to me, that's out in the open now. If patriarchy is really under challenge and it's fighting back, So that's what you see right now. Women's voices play a key role here because if women don't speak, nobody's going to speak. When you silence women, you silence the whole thing. Anyway, that's how I see it right now. And I think in a way it's surprising to me when people are surprised because this has been going on for a long time. And in some ways it's, it's really on the line right now. Very much, very much on the line. So it, it depends on constant constant silencing and constant overriding people's memories and saying, you don't really remember, this is what really happened. And, you know, so people become unreliable narrators of their own life stories. But if you challenge it, and I think this is what's most alive for me right now, is that how accessible that under voice is if you just question the cover voice, that it's there. It was fantastic to speak with you. Um, I'll speak with you too. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you for listening to Subject to Power. You can find the show online at subjecttopower.com or subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts. I'd love to know your thoughts on these conversations, so please drop a note on the website or find us on social media. The best way to support the show is to rate and review Subject to Power on Apple Podcasts. It really helps other listeners find us. Subject to Power is written, hosted, and produced by me, El Kamihira. Audio engineering is done by Jason Sheasley at Abridged Audio. Cover art by B. Johnson. And music by Beware of Darkness.